Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles. Uh, we're in a series called Come and Follow, and we're going through uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 9, there's a story of a miracle. And what I'm going to do is it's a great passage, but to save time, I want you to go to the Gospel of Mark chapter 2 because Mark gives us a little bit more details. They're all in there in, in Matthew, but Mark expands it a little bit, and we want to draw as much as possible. We talk about the subject of miracles. Uh, to be transparent with you guys, I'm a little bit concerned about some of the things that's taking place in the Christian community. There are a couple of televangelists that are on the air. If I gave you their names, you would recognize them. They're names that you would be familiar with. One guy is saying this in light of this epidemic, pandemic that's taking place, the corona, uh, coronavirus, that if you would just touch the TV... He is going to pray healing. If you have that virus, if you just touch the TV, that grieves my heart. Another guy who's in trouble with the government, he is selling uh, the silver solution. That if you would take this silver solution, he is guaranteeing within 12 hours you'll be cured of this virus. I don't know how these folks get an audience, but one of the things, when you look at miracles in, in the New Testament, Jesus in particular that we're focusing on, when, when you look at those miracles, they're always verifiable. He's doing it in, in public. Majority of those, there's always someone there, but a lot of those are in public. So you can verify, is this true? There's a lot of what we would call charlatans out there that uh, prey on people. So I, it grieves my heart that, that this is taking place and these folks are getting national attention of what they're doing in the name of Christ. And we know there's going to be folks that are going to be like that. But we realize when Jesus... When he did a miracle, you could verify it. And also about a miracle that Jesus would do is always a teaching point. There's always a teaching point. There's always a purpose of why he was doing something. He didn't do it just to do it. There's always a teaching point. The miracle that we're going to study today, there is a teaching point. And I hope by the end that you will realize what that truly is. So here we have... Uh, the story. Let's read in Mark chapter 2. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days. Now, Capernaum is now his headquarters. He'd been in Judah early on. He'd been up in Nazareth. And so he has now, because of some things there, he's moved down several miles down to Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. It says in it was heard that he was in the house. That house, as far as the best that we can speculate, would have been in Capernaum, would have been Peter's house. It would have been the house that Peter would have hung out, the, the headquarters there. So you're getting a little bit of understanding here. It said, immediately many gathered together so that there was no room, no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Wouldn't you love for these faith healers to preach the word? What was drawing this crowd was the preaching of Jesus. Of course, they're very intrigued with the miracles as well, but Jesus is preaching the word. They're packed out. They're out the door of this house. Then... They came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. Now you got to know in that time, a house, uh, they would have an outside stairwell that would go up to the roof and they could do a lot of things up on the roof. And so that's what they're up to. They said, okay, we want to get... Our friend to Jesus, he's paralyzed. We want to get him to Jesus. They uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, the roof is made of 
clay and hardened clay and, and, and grass. And so they broke through it. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes who were sitting there, you see, these guys were the gatekeepers of Israel. They, if there was a teacher out there, they wanted to make sure that the teaching was, quote, correct. And so they had uh, plants. Well, we would use the word, uh, a cold word like a spy. These scribes are in there spying to see what Jesus was teaching. So here we find, and some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now that statement is correct, is it not? Real important. Remember a miracle that Jesus would do. He's going to get it verified, but also it's going to have a teaching point. So you're starting to get a feel. What is that teaching point? Here these guys say... Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of all of them. So all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Several pictures that we want to to draw today. Some images that you will walk away with this morning. When we think about the life of Christ, here he's in the area of Capernaum. He's on the Sea of Galilee. And that is the Sea of Galilee. And we've got our tour group, and we're right there in Capernaum. We're there on the shoreline of Capernaum. And this is the setting of the story. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the synagogue there. And this is where Jesus would have been, the location. Now, this is built up through the centuries of time, but there's a great picture here. If you look closely, they'll see the dark, the gray-looking rock. That would go back to the time of Jesus. So that would have been the level during the time of Jesus. He would have been in the synagogue. He would have been in Capernaum. And we talked about Peter's house. Now, we're guessing, but this would be something similar. They have a, uh, a church uh, built over Peter's house. But this is Peter's house right there on the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. This is where the story is taking place. It's packed out. Jesus is in there and he's teaching. He's preaching the Word of God. He's expounding the Word. Folks are packed into the house. Folks are outside the door. And man, it's just where you just can't get any, anybody else in there. You got a situation where there's a man who has some type of paralysis. Maybe he was a paraplegic. We, we know he couldn't walk, but he had some... He had some friends, and those friends said, you know what, we, we've got to get this man to Jesus. So that's what we find. Uh, we find that scenario, they're breaking through there, and, and they've got to get this guy to Christ. Uh, they've got to do this. You know, when that takes place, when you've got friends like that, transformation can happen. When you've got friends like that who are willing to be creative... Here they are, we know there's at least four of them. They're carrying this man who cannot walk. He's got some type of paralysis. And they said, okay, we've got to get this man to Jesus. Could you imagine when they got to the house there where Jesus was teaching and they saw the crowd, they said, oh, well, we tried. That's it. Sorry. No, they didn't do that. They used some creativity. Why? Because they had a vision. They, they realized if... If we could get our friend to Jesus, if we could get him in the presence of Jesus, Jesus could help him. 
And so instead of uh, giving in to the obstacle, they said, hey, wait a minute. Creativity. There's a stairwell. And it goes up to the roof. And they said, are you in? Are you in? Are you? Yeah, let's go for it. So they took him up those stairs, took him up to the roof, and they said, like, the roof's there. I mean, they had beams and all. It's like a box. And, but they said, you know what? We can get a three-foot section right here. And they tore it open, and they said, hey, should we just drop in? Yeah, let's just drop him in. So they, they lowered him down into that living room, and everyone just stopped and said, what in the world is going on here? Someone is, who is this guy? He's coming down on some type of pallet, some type of cot, and, and they're lowering down. And so you say, oh, man, that's pretty creative. But also I say, that's pretty compassionate. To have a friend like that, to have that kind of compassion that we're willing, to, no, no longer do we you know, guess about their love for this man we know, and no telling how far they've had to carry him. They're carrying their friend to Jesus. That's compassion. Could I encourage you to do the same, to, to bring your, your friends to Jesus? And we have an opportunity as a church, and we've done it this morning. We have actually done it through the power of prayer. We have carried folks to the throne of God's grace, to the presence of the Lord, in essence, and say, God, we are bringing our friends before you. Do you realize for everyone who joined in prayer for Brian Landrum, what you are doing? You're doing exactly what these guys were doing in the New Testament. You were carrying Brian and Tracy before the throne of God's grace, saying, Lord, would you touch him? Would you heal him? We did the same thing with Jasper. We carry Jasper before the throne of grace through prayer. And, and we're doing this all the time. This, this week, uh, a friend of the Cranston's who's now a friend of mine, his wife is, is battling cancer once again. And through power of prayer, Scripture, bringing those Scriptures in, saying these are the verses God has put on center in my, in my heart today that we prayed for Crystal this morning. These are the verses, and we gave the verses. Can I encourage you, as you bring folks before the throne of God, as you're carrying them, maybe there's a Scripture passage or a promise that God has said, I want to pray this, a psalm, or wherever in the Scripture, that you're going to pray this over that person. Maybe this week, as you feel led, you would text, the scripture that God put upon your heart, and then you would convey that to Kay and let her read that to Jasper, or to Tracy to let her read that to Brian. That would be so powerful, and that's what they were doing. They were showing compassion. Do you realize that we have 18 intercessors in this church who this day, there may be two or three who have dedicated this day to pray for this church, for this ministry, for this staff, for this pastor? That's compassion. Be creative. So that's one of the things they did. What a picture that we'll not forget that in that location, they opened up a place in the roof and they lowered their friend into Christ. Transformation it is going to happen in his life because we read it in the story. Here's a second image that we want you to walk away with. When, when Jesus sees faith, mighty works can happen. Verse number five. Uh, this kind of stumped me here. And when Jesus saw their faith, do you realize faith can be seen? Faith is visible. What's going on in, in a person's life as they are exercising faith? And really, that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Look at this verse that comes out of James 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brother, if a man claims to have faith but has no works or, or deeds? Can such faith save him? If you've got genuine faith, authentic faith, it's going to show up in your life. It's going to manifest. And here, these guys so believe that Jesus can heal their friend that they have faith that Jesus can heal. And they're going to do by their actions, by their works, they're going to bring him before Jesus because they believe 
that Jesus can heal. And so when that happens, when Jesus sees faith, He loves to do mighty works. Verse uh, number 5, it says, He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is a stumper. Because I don't think that those team of guys and that man were looking for forgiveness. They were looking for healing. I said, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. We're, we're here to, to be healed. That, that's why we're here. But Jesus is doing something. Remember, miracles always have a teaching point. This is what we need to understand. There was a, a thought pattern in that day, and it was in the Old Testament, but the rabbis, this is what they would teach. The rabbis, the, the leading source of the Old Testament law, the rabbis would say there is no sick man healed of his sickness until all his sins have been forgiven him. Now that would have been unknown. That would been something, you know, oh yeah, we, we know what the, what the religious leaders, what they teach. You cannot be healed uh, because there, there's sin. And that's the reason why you're, you're all messed up. Uh, in the Old Testament, there's a great story of the man uh, called Job. You remember Job? A righteous man. Uh, God's assessment of Job. He was blameless. And so we, we know that the Lord allowed a test to go into his life. Satan was trying to destroy him through that. But, but God says, no, I, I'll let you test him because I, I'm working something out for his good as well through this. But Job had some friends. Do you remember those friends? They came to see Job. That was so thoughtful of them. And they hung around for a little bit. And then one that says, man, I can't stand it any longer. Job, what did you do? What, have, what sin have you committed to be in the condition that you're in? That's what those guys were saying. If you know that story, that's what they were saying to Job. Job, you're so sick. I mean, you're, you're, at, the, you're, you're at the point of death. You're so pale looking. You're, you're hurting. You're miserable. Uh, your wife has already said, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, it's just bleak. But his friends come along and say, man, you have, you have some kind of sin. And you're not telling us. And until you tell us, you're not going to get better. See, that was the mentality. That doesn't carry over to the New Testament. You remember in John chapter 9, there was this man who was born blind, and his disciples said to him, uh, Lord, uh, who sinned, his mom or dad, that this man would be blind? Jesus goes, ah. No, 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 no. No, this, is, this sickness is for the glory of God. You, you see, but Jesus, He understands the culture he knows the mentality, and he realizes this is where these guys are coming from. He's going to say if sin caused his sickness, then he must be forgiven before I can heal him. See, he's teaching something in this miracle. He, he's getting down. He's peeling back the, just the surface here, and he's going deep, and he said, okay, this is what's so important. And he's saying to us, and he's saying, don't be so cruel when you begin to pass judgment when someone's having a difficult time. You may not have all the pieces together, so don't do that. Someone who's uh, godly may be going through a tough time. Don't say, man, I bet they've done some kind. No, get that out of your system. Get that out of your mind. So we go down to verse number 6 and, and 7. And as you see verses 6 and 7, there is that entourage, those group of scribes. And they are taking notes to try to catch Jesus in something because He's got a crowd. I mean, folks are following Jesus and they say, whoa, whoa, what is this movement? Uh, we got to put some plants in there and just see what this guy is saying. Could you imagine when Jesus said, "Here, I mean, they're probably puzzled. Why are these guys doing this? Man, what, what is going on? And here's Jesus. And Jesus says that statement, Son, your sins be forgiven you. Did you hear what I think? I just heard. Did, 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 he, did, did he just indicate that he was going to be the forgiver of, of sins? Yeah, I think that's what he said. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. Oh my goodness. Oh, we know our Bible. Leviticus 24. If someone blasphemes, they ought to be stoned. <gasps> Jesus. He's a blasphemer. 
That's what was going on. You see, they didn't like what Jesus said. When we put all this together, Jesus says, you know, in verse number 8, I, I know what you guys are thinking. I, I have a question for you. And Jesus, they, uh, I've read, said He used over 100 questions. A great way of teaching is asking questions. And He asked them this question, hey, which one is easier? Is it easier to forgive sins or to say to someone, rise up and walk? Let's take a poll ourselves. How many of you would say it's easier to say to someone, rise up and walk? Anybody going to vote in this poll? Okay. How many of you say, well, it's uh, easier to say your sins have been forgiven? How many are not going to vote at all? Just, okay. <laughs> and you're right. The majority is right. It's much easier to say your sins be forgiven. How are you going to verify that? How are you going to verify that your sins are forgiven? Oh, thank you so much. I mean, if, well, let's think, you know, if we were to lead someone to Christ, let's do some hypothetical situations. And we were to, to come down here and say, okay, here's Carrie St. John. Let's just suppose, this is just an illustration, that, that I just led Carrie to Christ. And when we know when someone comes to Christ that there would be some type of visible sign that, you know, stuff just floats, all of his sins just floats out of him and goes out the window. Go, oh, okay, that's good. And let's say it's Hoss over here. And, and I lead Hoss to Christ. And all of his sins float and float and float and float and float out the window. You, you say, okay, all right. The, you say, okay, I can see that. But in this situation, how can you verify? So Jesus is saying, all right, I, I'm going to, to teach you here something, and that's what He's doing. Verse number 10, that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. I say to you, rise, take up your bed, and go home. So with that statement, if I heal him, that proves he has been forgiven. Because unless he is forgiven, he cannot be healed. That was pretty much their, their logic. That's what they were saying. There's no way possible for this guy or for anyone. And, and that whole logic is now being challenged. He is saying, do I not have power to forgive sin? Yes, indeed. He is bringing to them the reality. He knows their thinking. Well, this guy can't be healed until he's been forgiven. So Jesus says, okay, I'm going to go ahead and forgive him. And to prove that I can forgive him, I'm going to heal him. Are you following? What this is sending the message of is quite important, which leads us to the third image. When Jesus exercises Power, amazement can happen. Amazement. We are amazed. So what Jesus said, in light of the fact that you can see, I can heal him physically, you should believe that I healed him spiritually. I have power over the material realm and I have power over the metaphysical physical realm. I can do this. I can go into this arena because what he is saying is, I am God. And that's what these guys were saying. Oh, if he can forgive sin, remember their statement that was true, only God can forgive sin. Jesus is saying, your sins be are forgiven. He is saying, here's the teaching point, he is saying he is God. And that's exactly right. This is in essence when Jesus, please realize the logic of your own theology, guys. I am God. I forgave the sins and I can cause a paralytic to walk. I am God. Jesus, that's what he's declaring in this miracle. And I want to tell you the, the effect of this is quite remarkable. They were all amazed. This guy took up his pallet, rode it up, and he walked out of there. 
Amazing when you look at this. In Luke's account, he says this, he, he went home praising God. He went home praising God. He said, why did he go home? Because Jesus told him, you need to go home. Jesus tells you to do something, go home. And I think so is the principle. He said, I want, I want you to go home because following Jesus begins at home. Are you listening? Following Jesus begins at home. Can your family members see Jesus in you? I, I look at this and I'm amazed because this guy was a, a recipient of, of a double miracle. Not only did he get strong legs, he got a clean heart. The miracle of salvation, a transformation of God working in His life and in our lives. So what do we walk away with? I think is this. Man, if you've got a problem, bring it to Jesus. He is the problem solver. He is the miracle worker. He has all power. Do you see power on earth is given to Jesus? The Father has given Him this authority. And here the Lord has delegated to us the ability to say, Lord, I can't handle this. I'm casting my care on You. If you got a problem, bring it to Jesus because you know His, his mission statement is, well, if, you just, if you're still in Mark, look at chapter 1, verse 38. He says, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. This is the reality. You can come to Christ in that relationship. Here's something else. If others have a problem, bring them to Jesus. Do you remember some of the things that we studied earlier on in this message about these friends? What did they use? They used creativity. They used compassion. Creativity. Why? Because this man is not going to get to Jesus unless they help him. It may be that you have someone who is unable in themselves in the state that they're in right now ever to come to Jesus. Could you use some creativity to bring folks to Jesus? I'm looking here and I'm thinking Waffle House. Waffle House. That's like a mission station of this church now. God is doing incredible things at the Waffle House. That's creativity. Or it might be that you'd like to give a book to a friend who's, who's questioning uh, about spiritual things. And you say, listen, I, I, want to, I want to give this book to you. I want you to read this book and we'll come back. I'll come back in maybe a week or so and maybe we'll just talk about chapter 1. Just using creativity. You're being compassionate, bringing someone to Christ because they're not coming on their own. They're not coming on their own. We're going to have to carry them. And then this final thing. If you come to Jesus, beware of expecting too little. He rewards faith. That's the only thing that He's responding to. I mean, I, I think of John down here, and we were talking yesterday, and just the domino effect of what God is doing, some, uh, of a couple of things, and, and now it's just spider webbing out, and I think it's up to 25, maybe 30 things have happened off of one event. God is touching, 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 touching. It's going generation, 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 generation to other folks now. What God can do. What is He going to do? God is up to something in this pandemic. He's going to open up hearts that have been closed for a long time. So let's not get our heads down, but let's look up and say, my goodness, what is He going to do in this? Coming back to that teaching point. His ability to accomplish a visible miracle would confirm His ability to accomplish an invisible spiritual one. We are in the presence of a living God 
who is always at work. Even now, the darker it gets, the brighter the light shines. When man says, well, I'm rich and need of nothing, when they have nothing, that's when they're going to bow and say, I'm empty. We understand. We're, we're coming before Him saying, Lord, we understand Your identity. That's what He's saying. Hey guys, these scribes, do you, have you got it figured out yet? I am God. We know His identity. We know who He is. And so as His people, part of His family, let's exercise our faith and come and just come before Him with just thanksgiving and praise and living a life out of faith because we know this is His, this is his heartbeat for us to live into the abundance of who Jesus is, Christ in us. In the midst of circumstances, I'm grateful that I can come and say we're not a cancer-centered church. We are a Christ-centered church. The events that come in our life, that's not the center of our life. Our center is Christ and what He wants to do through these events, these circumstances. It's all to His glory. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Folks, we're living for eternity. And how we have these opportunities come before us, God is saying, I am entrusting you with this trial. How will you respond? Will you become bitter? Or will you become better and grow in grace and knowledge of me? What a time to be alive. We're living in biblical times. Because He still is doing miracles. Let's pray together.